Last time on Dragon Ball Z, Vegeta, feeling himself more than he ever has before following his recent Super Saiyan transformation, decides that he is just a guy to smoke on that android pack solo, despite all the warnings he had received from his son Trunks about their capabilities. After doing Dr. Jarrell extra greasy in his own hideout, Bell, Biv, and DeVoe decide to run their GTA 5 protocol and look for a whip to steal so they can make a nice leisurely ride over to Son Goku's place to give him a nice merciful end while he's still in the thick of fighting off the monkey pox he contracted. Shouts out the smalls in the comment section for those bars by the way i was rolling when i read that never want to be left out of a party even without an invite vegeta runs down the androids on the street and starts talking extra spicy roasting each one of the robots individually until 18 decides that she had enough of this troll doll for one lifetime and decides to square up what occurred next was one of the worst ass beatings vegeta has ever suffered in his life the power of his misogyny and super saiyan transformation being no suitable match for android 18 size 7 doc martins who left the poor prince with two shattered arms as well as a shattered ego and the rest of the z fighters didn't fare much better with 17 and 18 clearing their whole squad low diff in a matter of seconds leaving lex luther the only man standing Sensing that bald man will put up about as much of a fight as a coffin baby, the androids decide to continue their hike over to Goku's, recommending that the little guy hook his friends up with a few perks to take the edge off of some of the wounds, and they know where to find them if they're goofy enough to want a round too. Professor X scans the battlefield in other shock at the bus ass he just witnessed, but unable to shake his desires to help his friends somewhat, Krillin runs after the androids and asks them just what the hell is it they want. He points out that they could have put their entire squad on pack watch if they wanted to, but instead they just left from half alive like Batman be doing villains in Gotham and he just does not understand. Android 17 cracks a smile and replies simply to Wojak that it's all a game. It's just a game. They already know they can smoke every life form on earth if a mood struck them, but it's much more fun to draw things out, let things simmer for a little while before finishing off the meal. Then the Krillin's absolute shock, 18 the stallion begins to approach, letting Krillin know that she always had a thing for short bald weaklings and gives him a peck on the cheek, unknowingly activating the simp gene line dormant within Krillin's DNA and setting into motion the events that would lead to the creation of the greatest threat the earth's ever seen. As the androids float away to brainstorm what black air force activity they plan to engage in next, Krillin fires that moment with 18 into a spank bank for later as he recalls that he left all of his homies at death's door a mile or two back and he's the designated bean holder krillin returns and passes out the senzus like smarties on the first day back to school and his homies slowly begin to get the feeling back in their legs they realize that the androids literally just walked off without finishing the job letting them know that they did not even view them as enough of a threat to be worth finishing off and after the tossing they just received it's honestly not hard to see why vegeta wakes up after verifying that his three-point arm is back in full effect and flies off without a word to the other fighters. Trunks is about to fly off too, but Piccolo warns him against this, reminding Trunks of his father's complicated relationship with women and how he just got his insides pushed out by one. So now may not be the best time to try to talk to that man rationally. Then this man Kingpin speaks up and is like, yo, I'm sorry. I just sat there playing tiddlywinks while y'all got folded. I for real just froze up and I didn't know what to do. Piccolo looks over and is like, yo, I want to be mad. But in all honesty, Trunks was a super saiyan and got slept in one elbow. So I really don't know what we were expecting a straight human with no alien DNA to do out there. We were absolutely bugging. Tien speaks up, saying now y'all know how I like glazing up Goku maybe more than anybody in here, but let's keep it a bean. If Orstein and Smo were able to pack up Trunks and Vegeta that easy, I don't think even my mans is going to be enough to get us out of this one. Then to make matters even worse, Trunks is like to keep it a whole buck with y'all. These androids are even worse than the ones in my timeline. Like I was getting folded in the future, but it was not like this these fellas is totally different after the fighters briefly reflect on the reality that it really might be game over this time piccolo speaks up he tells goku's cheerleaders to go grab that man from his crib and take him somewhere safe because if the androids are gonna body him they at least wanted to be after his chlamydia clears up Krillin then asks Piccolo what he's about to do, noticing a puzzled look on his face and telling him that he can open up because they're all friends now. Piccolo looks over at this man and is like, friends? Boy, I will give you that freeze a second for him special if you ever talk to me like that again. I am Demon King Piccolo. We are not friends. I'm only playing patty cake with y'all right now while I figure out the right time to take over the world. And immediately following this cap session, Piccolo flies off. Tien sees this and is like, damn, who pissed in his cornflakes? After all the beatings he's taking with this man 
and Piccolo over the years. Now, though, Krillin knows it's a front. He tells Tien and Trunks that he's pretty sure old Ma Jr. just ran off in the direction of Kami's lookout and puts them on game on how they were told on Namek that if Piccolo and Kami were complete, the Saiyans that originally came and watched them would have been a non-factor. He continues, telling them that if Piccolo's willing to throw away his whole identity to fuse with Kami, then that must really mean they stepped in it big time because this man Piccolo hates Kami more than Yamcha hates catching a dub. Tien is like, wait, hold up. Don't that mean if Piccolo and Kami fuse and the Dragon Balls get waxed as well? Krillin, head glistening, talks to his bald brother in arms and tells him that this is probably true, but in all honesty, the Dragon Balls will be going regardless if the androids caught up with them. So at least this way, they got a semblance of a shot trying to make it through all this. Then little old Trunks pipes up and is like, yo, where y'all think my pop, uh, I mean Vegeta ran off to? Uh huh. Krillin looks over at him a little sideways and is like, you can cut the act, Brody. We already know who your sperm donor is. You don't gotta pretend no more. Tien fights back the urge to tell Trunks that his dad probably went back to brush up on a Sigma male podcast game after getting washed by the lady android, but instead he takes the high road, telling him that knowing Vegeta, he's probably mad salty after that massive L and is working on a new technique to pull out in the clutch that's guaranteed to fail when they need it most. Trunks then looks up in the sky with a warm smile as we get a brief segue over to Vegeta, who's flying through the air a Mach 10 fighting back tears as he has flashbacks of his arms getting snapped like Kit Kats, cursing out 18 internally and thinking about all the get back in the kitchen jokes he's about to cook her up with the next time they meet absolutely tragic after a brief scene of goku taking his testicular torsion medicine we return to the view of piccolo who was rolled up on kami's lookout and get straight to business within seconds of touching down this man piccolo is like hey yo where's kami ugly ass at then we catch poor kami strolling up with his cane and man serving as piccolo continues cooking up the elderly green bean my junior stands posted up on the lookout for a minute just sizing kami up before he's like you already know why i'm here so don't make me ask twice Kami starts reminiscing briefly, telling Piccolo that he never thought the day would come where the two of them would once again need to get inside each other. Piccolo immediately tells Kami to never say it like that ever again in his life, and that the expired guardian needs to get one thing straight. The only reason this is happening right now is so Piccolo can use his near worthless carcass to power up and throw some hands. Man said that the world does not need a god right now, it needs a hitter, and Kami, I am that hitter. Kami smiles, reluctantly having to admit that as disrespectful as my junior has been so far, that was indeed a cold line in the bars are to be respected. Kami agrees to assist Piccolo with the union, but only under the condition that they continue to monitor if the androids are actually malicious or not. Piccolo, no longer able to keep his composure, is like malicious. Big dog, did you not see what they did to us out there? Beavis and Butthead punched me in the chest so hard my shoulders were touching. They put Tien to sleep, hit Trunks with a single elbow drop that ended his whole career, and damn near snapped off both Vegeta's arms and had him looking like a Ken doll. I ain't trying to hear nothing about these androids not being malicious. Delicious. Kami's like, look, I hear you, gang, but let's be honest. Y'all were the ones that instigated that fight, which was pretty dumb, I might add. And on top of that, even after these androids completely embarrassed y'all, they still let you live even though they could have put you on a t-shirt 50 times over. Is that not correct? Extremely salty, but with no real clap back, Piccolo's like, all right, smart guy, we'll do it your way. We'll just sit here and wait. But when the whole earth starts looking like Trunks' PTSD flashbacks, I don't want to hear a single solitary word about it. While Piccolo's thinking about hitting Kami, the androids are thinking, thinking about hitting a lake as we catch them continuing their hike on the highway as they finally come across a vehicle that will soon serve as their base of operations. After 16 picks up the entire cargo van and dumps out the contents like some old change in a pair of pants pockets, the trio skirts off towards old Kakarot's house, with the anime treating us to some filler adventures. Almost like a Fast and Furious-esque car chase seen through the mountains with some Mad Max rejects, who Jack and Daxter promptly run off after threatening them with their foreheads if they come any closer. Once these hooligans have been dealt with, we return to the perspective of our ragtag group of heroes whom have arrived at Goku's house and are gearing up to put this man on a plane in an effort to avoid the android skullduggery that will commence if he's left at home. It's during this time that the anime treats us to some more filler content, giving us a montage of Goku fighting off night sweats as he has nightmares about getting isekai out of his own body and being forced to watch as the androids body bag his whole family. As low-key horrifying as this was to witness, I can't lie to y'all, I would definitely be the first one in line to read a copy of that time I got reincarnated as a jobber by son Goku when he gets dropped at Barnes & Noble. Following Goku's nightmare fuel though, we jump to the Z homies on a plane to Muten Roshi's house where they try to make sense of everything that's 
what's happened. Shrunks is still unable to process just how much more savage the androids in this timeline are and why so many things have been coming up Millhouse. With how screwed up everything has gotten, Trunks states that maybe the only thing he can do now is go back in time and take out Jero before he even creates the androids. Little Gohan speaks up, telling homie that that's cool and all, but would that really just make the androids in their timeline disappear? After all, with all the changes that have happened in their world, Trunks' future is still out here looking like Gotham. Deciding to ignore the straight he just caught, Trunks has to let Little Gohan know that he really is spitting, and that making changes in the past seems like it ultimately just causes alternative realities to exist. It doesn't just suddenly fix the problems of the present. Quick side note, after reading and listening to it a couple times, I really like this convo on the ship. I feel like it perfectly encapsulates one of the key points in the Android and Cell saga, that being that our actions have consequences. There are no cheat codes or do-overs in life, even if you do got a time machine. Each one of us is responsible for holding on to every W and every L we take, and these outcomes are the direct karmic results of our actions. This whole thing with the androids came about as a result of Goku paying their price for his actions against the Red Ribbon Army back in the day. Trunks is being forced to learn that no amount of running in the past will help you escape from the present, and only by directly confronting your demons yourself can you hope to move past them. Big shout outs to the homie Seth, the editor on this channel, who recently got done with his son Goku analysis. If you haven't checked it out yet, I highly recommend it. Homie does a deep dive into a lot of these themes in greater detail than I could get into in these videos, and he's one of the best in the business. You make your way over there, let him know KJM sent you. Now back to our regular scheduled programming. After the dialogue on the plane, we're treated to Vegeta in the middle of his favorite activity, screaming while powering up in the wasteland by himself thinking about Kakarot. The Prince of Compound Fractures is still unable to math the math as to how he was able to get dirt napped so thoroughly as a Super Saiyan. And it's this moment that gives us a brief foreshadowing to both Vegeta's and Goku's intentions for the future, realizing that there may be a level of growth even beyond the Super Saiyan, and if they want to end up not as a part of Skynet, they're going to have to get through some serious growth and quick. Back on the plane, Yamcha starts in and tells Krillin that he should probably call Bulma to get her up to speed on everything that's happened. Krillin looks more pressed than when he sensed Frieza coming back, asking him why in the world he's gotta be the one to call her. Then this man Krillin looks over at Trunks and is like, look, young blood, no offense, but I've known your mom for a hot minute and she be on one for absolutely no reason sometimes. Young know, Trunks laughs real quick and is like, say less, Onk. I've been around her my whole life and I already know how she is sometimes. Krillin mans up though and calls up Capsule Corp to let Bulma know what's up. As expected, Bulma gets on the phone positively tripping with no inside voice, asking why nobody called her till now and if her hot son is on the plane. Krillin's like, gross, but yes, and be careful what you say, please, because you're on speakerphone. Bulma composes herself and gives the gang a quick rundown, letting them know that there was a report of a farmer asking Capsule Corp to investigate the appearance of a weird vehicle next to his property. After seeing images of it, it definitely looks like it's a time machine Trunks arrived in. Trunks tells Bulma that this has got to be Cap because he has a capsule with his time machine on him right now. Bulma says she had a feeling this might be the case and it might be a good idea to investigate the wreckage and she'll meet him over there in a few. With this new mystery being established, Trunks heads over with the coordinates Bulma provided with Gohan coming in as a wingman for support. Gohan asks Trunks if his future really is his ass as it sounds. Trunks confirms, telling Gohan that the world's population in his timeline is sitting somewhere around 10k maximum now. The cities have all been demolished and they live underground like the rebels from the Matrix, living off potato skins and sewer water for sustenance. Gohan Gohan regretting that he asked, tells him, yeah, you need to find a weakness for them robots ASAP, because my tummy hurting just thinking about your timeline, let alone living in it. Deciding that this was enough earth shattering sadness for one convo, the two finally make their way to Bulma's coordinates. As the two arrive, they're greeted by a woman's voice yelling, hey, Trunks, your fine ass mama her. Unsure whether to ignore it or respond, Trunks awkwardly greets his mom as they begin surveying the wreckage. Upon a closer look at the ship, Trunks confirms that it is 100% his time machine, but there being two of them makes absolutely zero sense. Inside the vessel, things get even weirder when the game come upon two weird pods that Trunks just picks up raw dog directly in his hands with no types of sanitizer. Gohan sees them and is like, hey yo, they got Koopas in your timeline? Realizing that Gohan may have more in common with Goku than he realized, ignores this while Bulma clarifies that these look like some type of egg, and whatever it was, appears to have now hatched. While Bulma examines the husk, Trunks tries to boot up the machine. But Trunks is able to deduce that whatever it was got here four years ago, meaning it hit the ground a whole year before he arrived in front of the Z-Warriors himself and gave them that warning. Following this foreboding piece of news, we return to Kami, who stops his people watching to inform Piccolo that for the last few years, he could sense that something was off and the time may come to few sooner rather than later, because a threat even greater than the androids might have just popped off. And right here, my friends, is where we'll call it for today. Bro, Toriyama was once again in his bag on this one. 
this right here from my mileage is one of the most interesting parts in all of Dragon Ball because as a viewer you truly have zero idea what's going on and you're just as confused as the characters are about what's gonna pop off next. Tune in next time as a new threat is revealed. Kami, sensing the danger, decides to fuse with Piccolo, but will the transformation be enough or has the Earth's fate finally been sealed? Be easy y'all and I'll talk to you again in the next video.